All right, let's take a quick look at reviewing radicals. So this is a topic that you guys covered in Algebra 1, and we're going to take a look at it right now. And basically, what is a radical? You know, you're probably used to seeing things that look like this. Underneath, there's a radical symbol. Underneath of it, we have what's referred to as the radicand. The index is what's here. Now, typically speaking, everything that we're going to be doing in geometry is of a, an index of 2, which means we're going to be dealing with square roots. But I could take a cube root, which means I would put a 3 there. I could take a fourth root, so forth and so on. Uh, since we're typically dealing with square roots, you know, you usually don't see square roots written that way. We see them written with no index listed there. And it's sort of similar, I like to equate it to like when we write a variable. If I write x, what's the power of x? Well, it's x to the first power. And we're so commonly used to seeing x's, we don't write x to the first, y to the first, we drop that, right? Well, we do the same thing with radicals. We, we use, typically, square roots are used so often that uh, the index is assumed to be 2 if it's not listed there. So when we look at radicals, we're basically looking at uh, defining what it means when we have a squared number. So if I said, I can be general right now, if I said the square root of uh, a squared equals a. So whenever the index can match the power underneath the radical sign, that term is going to come out. Because it's basically saying, since I'm doing with an index of 2, the what number squared would give me a squared? Well, that would be a. So if I had a 36 there and I said what number squared would give me 36, the answer would be 6 when we take the square root of 6. Now, <clears throat> when we look at this, um, we're going to see, like, you have to know your um, perfect square. So knowing your perfect squares of 2 squared, 4, 3 squared, 9, 4 squared, 16, 5 squared, 25, 6 squared, 36, 7 squared, 49, 8 squared, 64, uh, 9 squared, 81, 10 squared, 100, 11 squared, 121, 12 squared, 144, 13 squared, 169. We could keep going and going and going and listing all these perfect squares, but these are just terms that we have to be familiar with and being able to uh, deal with. So when I look at square roots, we're going to first define, like, how do we simplify these things? So let's just put some numbers up here. So if I said simplify the following, so I had the square root of uh, 64, the square root of 81, the square root of uh, 100, the square root of 12, the square root of, mm, I'll take your pick, 32, okay? When they're perfect squares, it's real easy. Like, you could type that in on your calculator if you weren't sure, right? The square root of 64 hit equals, and now keep in mind, when we take a root, if we were in Algebra 1, a root has two, two possible answers. It could be positive, like if I said what number squared gives me 64, it could be positive 8 and it could be negative 8. But we're in the land of geometry where we're dealing with, and you're going to see in the next chapter, these radicals are going to basically be dealing with lengths of sides and triangles. We're never going to have a side length that's going to be a negative number. So when I say what's the square root of 64, we're just going to say it's 8. And again, like the long way of doing this, I could write this as the square root of 8 squared. If the index matches the power, 8 comes out. Square root of 81 is 9. And again, we could write that as the square root of 9 squared. Power matches the index, the number comes out. Now, it's all fine and dandy when we have perfect squares, because you could keep using your calculator to do that. The square root of, you know, 256, it equals. Is it a perfect square? I don't know. You check it, it equals, and it gives you an uh, uh, integer or a whole number. Now, when we look at the square root of 100, uh, again, there's another perfect square, right? So 100 squared is, or uh, what number squared is 100 is 10. So we got square root of 10 squared, we get 10 out. But when we get to numbers that aren't perfect squares, like if you typed in the square root of 12 on your calculator and hit equals, it's going to give you the decimal equivalent of what the square root of 12 is. We don't want the decimal equivalent. I want to know what is square root of 12 exactly. And simplifying radicals is much like we just looked at simplifying ratios uh, or fractions when we were doing that uh, stuff with proportions. You know, I could leave it as, uh, you know, 16 over, or like 8 over 16, but it simplifies to one half. Uh, so when we look at radicals, I want to simplify this. So now you've got to get in the pr process of asking yourself, what number squared 
are, I'm sorry, what factors of 12 are perfect squares? So I listed, I'm listing, listing the fact, factors of 12. You know, 2 times 6, neither of those are perfect squares. 1 times 12, neither of those are perfect squares. But 4 times 3. Why did I pick 4 times 3? Because 4 is a perfect square. Now, we could rewrite this this way. Whenever I have a number under a radical sign, I could break that down into the square root of 4 times 3. Whenever I have two numbers being multiplied together underneath of a radical sign, a property of radicals is I can break that apart to say that's the same thing as the square root of 4 times the square root of 3. And then we did that because the square root of 4 is 2. So this would simplify to 2 root 3. Easy way to check your answer with this. Like if you get done simplifying a radical and you're like, I don't know if they're equivalent. Type in square root of 12 on your calculator, hit equals. Hit 2 root 3 on your calculator, hit equals. You better get the same decimal equivalent or else you screwed something up. Square root of 32. So let's say, all right, what factors of 32 are perfect squares? Now there's an easier, easy way to do this problem and a problem that's going to make it a little longer. Uh, so let's suppose you don't realize that 16 times 2 is 32, but you went, hey, I know 4 goes into it. That's an easy perfect square to remember. 4 times what's going to give me 32? Now, we can do it this way. An abbreviated way is that I would do it is I like to always do like a little factor tree right under 32. The number I'm going to pick that is the perfect square, in this case I'm going to pick 4, I would list first. 4 times what gives me 32? That's going to be 8. And then I always circled the perfect square. Now, this is just a habit I got into because when I circled it, I knew something had to happen to it for it to get out from underneath the uh, radical symbol. So the square root of 4, something's going to happen when it pops out. So if I simplify this right now, square root of 4 is 2. 8 still under the radical symbol. Now I've got to ask myself, is it still simplified? Is 8 a perfect square? No, it's not. Does it have any factors that are perfect squares? Yes. What are the factors of 8 that are perfect squares? Again, 4 and 2. Circle the perfect square. What's going to happen to that 4 when I take the square root of it? Turns into a 2. So now when it comes out, I've got to multiply it by whatever's already out in front of the radical symbol. Basically the coefficient out here, right? So I've got 2 times the square root of 4 is 2. I still have the 2 under the radical sign. And this is going to leave me with 4 root 2. So that's simplifying radicals when they are perfect squares. Simplifying two radicals when they're not perfect squares. And I know I'm sort of rushing through this, but this should be all review from what you guys did in Algebra 1. Um, <clears throat> so next thing, if we're adding and subtracting radicals, I like to think of radicals much like we would variables. If I said what 6x minus 2x, you guys would say, well, it's 4x's. If I had 6x's, I take 2 of the x's away, we have 4x's left. Well, if I put a radical with that, if I said what 6 root 2 minus 2 root 2, if I had 6 root 2's and I subtract 2 root 2's, how many root 2's am I going to have left? 4 root 2's. So when you're adding or subtracting radicals, you can only add or subtract them if they have the same radicand, the same number under the radical symbol. Obviously the same index, but we're dealing with the square roots in this. Just like if we had an expression that we were simplifying, you could only combine like terms. These are like terms that we're combining. That's adding and subtracting. Multiplying and dividing. Let's look at multiplying first. So multiplying, let's, uh, somebody give me a, um, a radical. So somebody says, what are you saying in the back there? 3 root 2. All right, 3 root 2 sounds good. So I'm going to go 3 root 2, and let's multiply that by uh, 4 root 3. So when you multiply radicals together, you multiply what's outside together, you multiply what's underneath together provided that the index is the same. Again, these are both square roots. So I'm basically multiplying the 3 times the 4, and then under the radical sign, I got the 2 times the 3. 3 times 4 is going to give me 12. 2 times 3 is going to give me 6. Always asking yourself when you're doing these problems, we get down to root 6. Is that simplified? Any factors of 6 that are perfect squares? Bet, 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 bet. No, they're not. So yes, that is simplified. 12 root 6. Let's look, suppose we had a problem like, uh, what was the other one I wrote down here? Let's change this up. Let's suppose I had 2 root 3 times 5 root 6. I'm going to do the same thing we just did over with this problem. Outsides together, underneath together. So I got 2 times 5 outside of the radical symbol, 3 times 6 underneath the radical symbol. 2 times 5 is going to give me 10. 3 times 6 is going to give me 18. 
Is 18 simplified? Is it a perfect square? Someone in the back says, no. Is any factors of 18 perfect squares? Somebody over here said 9 times 2. Why do we pick 9? Because it is a perfect square. I always, this is a habit I got into, I always listed the perfect square first because I know that's a number that's going to change. This number is nothing's going to happen to it. Square root of 9 is 3, so a 3 pops out. We got the radical symbol and we got a 2 underneath, so we get 30 root 2. Now, another way, let me just sort of like go, another way to do this, as these numbers get larger, sometimes I'm like, I would look at this and say, well, couldn't I write 6 as 3 times 3? So if I wrote it this way, I'm oh, sorry, 3 times 3, I meant, couldn't I write 6 as 3 times 2? So I could write it as 3 times 3 times 2. Much like if I could get two numbers squared, if I could get two numbers the same in here, if I'm taking the square root of 3 times 3, guess what's popping out? A 3. So that's multiplying radicals together. The last thing we can look at is dividing radicals. Well, first let me just put a little something up here on the board. When we're dividing radicals, if I said, what's the square root of A over B? That's the same thing as the square root of A over the square root of B. And I think I, I meant to put this up here earlier. You know, if I said, uh, well, let's do that in a second. So square root of A over B is the same thing as the square root of A over the square root of B. Again, as long as the indexes are the same here, I can simplify this before I divide it. So look, if I had a problem like the square root of uh, 6 divided by the square root of 3, well, I could look at that. Now, the long way to do this problem would be like, if I've got two radicals that are at the same index, I could write that as the square root of 6 over 3. 6 over 3 is a fraction simplifies to 2 over 1, which is 2, and I'm left with the square root of 2. But I could also take this problem, again, as long as the indexes are the same. If I can reduce underneath of a radical sign, I can. I'd go once, twice. What is the square root of 1? That's 1. What is the square root of 2? I can't simplify it. I'm left with root 2 over 1, which is root 2. Now the other thing we need to look at is what happens if we get a radical in the denominator. So if you guys remember back to algebra 1, let's make up another problem. Let's go uh, 4 root 2 over the square root of 5. So if I look at the radicals, 2 over 5 doesn't simplify. Uh, neither 5 nor 2 have factors that are perfect squares, so they're both already simplified. But a no-no is we can't have a radical in the denominator. So if you remember, how many people remember, how do we get rid of the radical that's in the denominator? Uh, Skippy in the back. Multiply it by root 5 over root 5. So if I multiply this thing by root 5 over root 5, what am I really multiplying it by? What is root 5 over root 5? What is anything over itself? Uno. If I multiply something by 1, am I changing it? Uh-uh. So now I've got 4 root 2 times root 5. Oh, and then in the denominator, I'm going to have root 5 times root 5. Properties of, of uh, fractions say if I'm multiplying two fractions together, I multiply straight across. So let's multiply the numerators. I got four times root, four root two times root five is really going to be. I'll write this out the long way just so you can see it. In the denominator, I've got well, that's going to give me four root ten. Down here, I got root five times root five or square root of five times five, which is going to be the square root of twenty-five. What does that simplify to? 5. Can I simplify the numerator? 4 root 10? I cannot. That doesn't have any factors that are perfect squares. Once I get rid of the radical down here, if you can simplify or cancel anything out with uh, any coefficients, you could do so. In a sense, whenever you multiply something by, now this is called rationalizing the denominator. Whenever you rationalize the denominator, when you've, whenever you multiply a radical by itself, I like to think of it this way. You're basically canceling out the radical sign to get whatever was underneath the radical sign. So we get 4 root 10 over 5. The last thing I just want to throw up here, and then uh, I'll let you go. You guys picked up the blue review worksheet today in class. Hopefully this clears some of the stuff up. But some of the other properties were, like, if I had um, square root of a squared, that was a. If I had the square root of a and I squared it, guess what I'm going to get? Well, look at it down here. If I said square root of a times another square root of a. Indexes are the same. Multiply what's underneath. What's a times a give me? a squared. What's the square root of a squared? a. So whether I have the square on the outside and I'm squaring a radical, it's basically going to cancel the symbol. If I have a square term underneath of a radical sign, that's what's going to come out. Only thing you got to be careful of when there's parentheses. If I put a 3 here 
or a 3 here, there's a big difference. If the 3 is outside, the square doesn't happen to it. If the 3 is inside, then i got to square each term that's inside that set of parentheses. So hopefully this clears everything up for you. Uh, worksheet tonight, we're going to review this again tomorrow. So uh, I'm not teaching this stuff tomorrow. We're going to jump right into problems, working things out. We're going to take it a step further and look at, uh, I think on the worksheet, um, there's very few adding uh, and subtracting radicals, but we're going to take it a step further looking at that. And then we're going to just take it a step even further where we're going to look at an equation like x squared plus 3 squared equals uh, 5 squared and say solve that for x. So now we're going to tie in, and basically it's setting us up for Pythagorean's theorem. So hopefully this helped clear everything up, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow.